Marco, nice to have you on the show. Matt, thanks for having me. Pleasure. It's a it's a great thing to be here. Yeah? Yeah. And you're from Kansas or Missouri? Kansas City. Mm. But I live on the Missouri side. Mm. Because Kansas City spans both Kansas and Missouri. Yeah. So I live on the Missouri side. Well, it's lovely to have you. Um, I'm really pumped about having this conversation. Me too. I, I kind of like that we didn't get to spend a lot of time beforehand. Mm -hmm. Because I want to get to know you and I yeah, want to, it'll be more fresh this way. Amen. So for those who haven't heard of you, could you just sort of sum up your story in maybe a minute or so? Yeah. So Marco Casanova, I'm Associate Director of Desert Stream Ministries, which is based in Kansas City. And I oversee Living Waters, which is our main program uh, here in the United States. And what are so, those things? So Living Waters is a process oriented group for men and women with various starting points of sexual and relational frustration, disintegration, coming together in the context of a church mm -hmm. um, and reading theology of the body together, receiving prayer for focused areas of need. And this confidential boundary space is, is unto becoming chased together. So we do that here in the States and throughout the world. We've been around for 43 years, um, founded by my great mentor, Andrew Comiskey, and um, I'm his successor. So okay. I'm, he's priming me to, to sort of take the ranks when, okay. when he retires. So. And, and your story real briefly before we get into it. Yeah, so born and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, I went to seminary right out of high school, St. Mm -hmm. Charles Borromeo in Philadelphia. And it was there that I encountered Jesus powerfully in my own broken sexuality. Mm -hmm. I struggle with same-sex attraction have since I was a kid and realized that early on, but didn't really know how to speak about it in out in the open, you know, <laughs> wasn't very therapeuticized to have like language to s speak of it, you know? So I hit it, you know, and I, I lied to go into the seminary because I knew that that was some sort of disqualifying factor. At least I thought, you know, <clears throat> right. At the point I entered the seminary, I was 18 years old, pretty addicted <laughs> to pornography and um, sexual sin. And when I got into the seminary, I started getting into more deviant behavior, mm -hmm. acting out with gay prostitutes in Philadelphia and living th this, duplicity li this mm -hmm. duplicitous life in the seminary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I was doing okay, like sort of maintaining, you know. Archbishop Chaput came, um, great friend and mentor, spiritual director. He he instituted a spirituality year, which is kind of a, a year between various year. It, I won't go into it, but we didn't want to do the year. It was an extra year. Mm -hmm. So we bemoaned the fact that he brought this extra year, but the year changed my life, made me a Christian. I can't wait to get into this. In a way, yeah. you know, and I surrendered to Jesus in an area where I felt most shame mm -hmm. and it was there that Bless it changed you. my life. Beautiful. And yeah, we can get into the rest. And you're now married. I am, yeah. To a woman. <laughs> to a woman, yes. <laughs> we have to clarify that these days. Yeah, yeah to a woman, Anya. Uh, she's from Poland. We met in Poland. Mm. So I was doing a Living Waters conference in Wadowice, right outside of Krakow, where John Paul II was born and raised. Mm -hmm. And she's from Krakow. We got married in Wadowice, uh, December of 2022. So okay, awesome. we're, we're rookies. So when did you first realize you had same-sex attraction? Uh, it was when I was a kid, probably in early elementary school, I just knew I was somewhat different, you know, struggling with feelings for my guy friends. And I didn't really know how to navigate that, you know, and as the years progressed, it, it became more of like a, a concretized reality for me. At least it was a, it was a worldview that was starting to develop and was in, enforced in a way through my own pornographic stuff mm -hmm. turning into gay pornography and was sort of reinforcing in me this same sex attraction thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it brought a lot of shame to me because it, no one ever spoke of it. I feel like the face of homosexuality has changed rapidly <laughs> recently where if, when I was growing up, there was still, I felt a lot of shame around it, at least where I grew up in Texas, you know? Mm -hmm. No one ever spoke about it. And so navigating that alone was just an interesting phenomena. You know, I, I, I didn't really want to speak about it, so I never did. But mm. when I entered the seminary, I realized, okay, I, I actually, I need help here. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I realized that I was um, in an all male environment, which right. sort of exacerbated my own vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, but 
reading John Paul II, getting infused with this amazing Catholic anthropology, I felt like I needed to be known by this Jesus who could help me, right? Like I needed to be helped here. This was the exact place that he could appropriate his merciful power because that's where I felt like I needed to be saved the most. It was the area that brought me to my knees the most. And it was, it was in the context of the seminary that I realized I couldn't do this anymore mm -hmm. alone in the dark, so to speak. I can't wait to get to that, but I yeah. just want to kind of linger a little bit more on your childhood. So mm -hmm. when, because I know, remember as a kid, you know, I found girls attractive as a young child, but it wasn't attractive in a sexual sense, right? Sure. It was like, I love this girl. She's so pretty. Please <laughs> sit by me. Please laugh at my right. jokes. And of course, then it kind of develops from there yeah. into more kind of sexual thoughts or feelings, that sort of thing. Um, and so for you, I presume it was something similar. Did you kind of begin with heterosexual pornography or was your first exposure or intentional decision to seek out pornography homosexual? My first exposure was heterosexual pornography, but then it turned into homosexual pornography because I found that the homosexual thing was a hiding place for me. Whenever I felt particular shame or neglect from my friends or whatever, like wherever I felt that I was not doing well, there was something about the homosexual pornography that was soothing to me, mm -hmm. you know? It was grasping for the masculine where I felt vacant in my masculinity, you know? And you wouldn't have articulated it like that no, at the time. No, not at all. But I knew that there was something about men that, that uh, um, intimidated me, yeah. but at the same time soothed me, you know? So trying to navigate that as a kid, I, I felt inherently damnable. I had a lot of religious mm. shame, you know. I wanted to be a priest since I was like four years old. Did you come from a strong Catholic family? Pretty strong, yeah. I mean, they're they're great. Um, I wouldn't say that they're like super, super, super Catholic, but they're Catholic enough. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. wonderful people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Mexican American family, you know. Mm. We don't really talk about sex. <laughs> it's kind of not something that we would speak about. Uh, but I. I did feel, in a sense, um, a lot of shame that I was just damaged goods, yeah. you know, that I was, there was something off about me, Dude, you know? I know that feeling well. And I, you know, it's so interesting because uh, now, hindsight, 2020, right? Hindsight, don't we love hindsight? It's just kind of normal. Like we all sort of internalize certain things from our family of origins. We mm -hmm. all have certain particular temperaments, you know, there, there, of course there's going to be broken brokenness that we educe from those experiences yeah. and whether it's same sex attraction or maybe you're, I'm other men that I know who are perfectly attracted to women, but don't know how to love a real woman. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the same sort of brokenness in a way, but different symptoms. It's kind of normal, right? to experience some sort of disorder in our sexual gift giving and being reconciled to the gift that we are. Mm. But I didn't know that, you know, no one was really speaking about that. Not to blame anybody. Honestly, I'm not here to sort of put the blame on the church. I don't really like that. You know, <laughs> never really felt bullied by the church or ostracized by the church. In fact, the church really helped me. You know, as a child, were you going to confession for this? I was, things? yeah. What, what was that experience like? And did you confess homosexual pornography specifically? I, I did, yeah. And it was really good. I mean, thank God for the amazing priests in my life. I feel yeah. like those masculine models have helped me integrate my own masculinity. Yeah, I needed them. You know, so people, ah, the church is. You know, I I didn't experience the church as that. And granted, of course, all of us have mixed experiences but i actually think that's a little room noise to sort of pin it on the church as she is not um really sympathetic to those who experience same-sex attraction i would say well no i mean the church is our healing ground you know she's mother to us mm. who are hurting and yeah she doesn't always get it right through her broken members but nonetheless it's in the space of the church yeah. not only that I have found wonderful priests to walk with, but that I have found a vision for my sexuality, <laughs> yeah. a vision beyond my fracture. But yes, to answer your question, these priests really, really helped me, you know? Yeah. But of course, I think they were limited, you know? These are celibate men mm -hmm. who maybe even struggled themselves. I don't know. Yeah. 
But I think oftentimes people who experience same-sex attraction, especially if you're locked in being a celibate for the kingdom of God, how do you help somebody integrate that? You know, mm-hmm. is it kind of white knuckle it, accept it as a cross and maybe you'll be a saint yeah. <laughs> or maybe what if there's more, you know? And it wasn't until later on that I, I kind of grappled with that question. Is there more for me beyond this? Did you have a religious conversion even amidst your Catholic upbringing? Was there some sort of event that you were like, mm. I'm going to start taking the Catholic faith more seriously? You know, I was always so attracted to the faith. It wasn't really a big, huge, Mm -hmm. you know, voila moment, you know, but I, I was always attracted to the saints, Padre Pio, my great patron, you know, John Vianney, Mm -hmm. these priests who were heroic, John Paul II, I was always magnetized to them. I think they showed me some sort of heroic masculinity that I really Mm -hmm. liked, you know? And that's when I really started to think, well, I kind of want to be a man of the kingdom of God. I want to give my life for this Jesus. Was there any part of you desiring to be a priest, maybe not having to deal with your same-sex attraction? I think so. There was a... How was was that the case? I think in a way it it took me out of the game of relating to woman. Yeah. Because the the priesthood is, is, is celibate. So it sort of, I could bypass the Garden of Eden, so to speak, you know. I didn't have to go into the dance of actually reckoning with her good and giving myself to her as a man and to dignify her in that self-gift. I I suppose I meant something more superficial, like this way you don't have to be asked why you're not dating women or... Oh, for sure. Yeah. So I didn't date at all. Mm -hmm. I remember I liked this girl towards the end of my high school career and uh, I was already accepted to the seminary. (laughs) (laughs) So kind of like, you know, it was a bypassing, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't think I, I knew that consciously but subconsciously it was a hiding place for me if that makes sense what the priesthood yeah yeah the celibate thing. it does yeah i mean even for myself as i discerned the priesthood and then discerned against seminary i had to realize that the seminary was a hiding place for me as well mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. i was so afraid of being a bad husband a bad lover a terrible provider a, you yeah. know i was so afraid of all of those things that i didn't want to look at mm-hmm. and so i thought well if i did if i come i didn't think it in this way but it felt to me at the time that if I just became a priest, if I just joined the seminary, then, you know, this girl who I really like, Cameron, who I'm now married to, she can at least respect me. You know, yeah. she'll look at me with some kind of reverence that I'm this pious Franciscan friar doing this great work, <laughs> you know. And, and it was only when I started to realize, oh, I think I'm running away more than mm. I'm running toward. Wow. But, but for me, it was a bit of a hiding place as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely I definitely felt that. And, you know, I, I, I had some good male friends in high school. Um but it wasn't until later in life that my male friends really asked more of that. Like, why aren't you dating? Mm-hmm. You know, do I have a past because I experienced same sex attraction? I don't know. There's, there's a value of having normal dudes around you saying, well, I don't, I see you as a guy and she likes you. Why not? Mm-hmm. Give it a try. Pursue. Mm-hmm. What do you have to lose? Everyone has some sort of resume of brokenness. Why is this so loaded? Why is this taking us out of the game? Yeah of possibly being robust marrieds. Yeah. One thing I've criticized and I'd love your take on is how it feels like, and maybe it only feels this way because it feels like the kind of gay agenda is pressing in so heavily upon us that we react in this way. But it feels like there's this this unhelpful dis- distinction between those who are heterosexual and those who are on the other island who are homosexual who are very different to us. Yeah. As opposed to what you kind of started to aim at earlier or talk about earlier is... Like we all experience brokenness in our sexuality. Right. And maybe it's more helpful just to be like, no, there's no us and them. It's just us. And we all have varied degrees of brokenness, which can express itself in different ways. What I, do you think? I agree with you, Matt. I think, I think that's why I love living waters because it's equal ground. We're all disintegrated. You know, that's mm. a commonality. So living waters, just to clarify, isn't just for those who have same sex attraction. No, it's for honestly, those of those who go through living waters, probably about 25% mm. of them experience same sex attraction. The majority of people just are kind of your normal moral felons. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so creating an equal ground where same sex attraction is just one symptom yeah. of broken sexuality. Yes. I think that's better mm-hmm. than sort of saying, oh, well, 
you go to your gay group, mm-hmm. you know, go to your gay group after we finish here and receive your, your special healing, right. you know, or right. your special accommodation, whatever the case might be. It's like, well, no, Jesus came to break the back of all moral disorder, you know, and to give us life, to, to reconcile us to the purity of our origins, no matter your proclivity, either to the same sex or to the opposite sex, broken as that might, may be. Mm-hmm. I like the equal ground. I think that's important for us to maintain. I don't like gay Catholicism. I don't think that works. Mm. What, what do you mean by gay Catholicism? To sort of assume the proclivity as identity. Is, is the experience of same-sex attraction, is it symptom or is it destiny? And I think to say I'm a gay Catholic assumes it as destiny, which I think says something conclusive about one's sexuality. In a way, it creates another nature. <laughs> We're all men for women, women for men. I mean, that's baseline T.O.B. John Paul II. Deeper than any fracture is an orientation Mm -hmm. of who he will be for her and she for him. I think that's better to just rest on that level ground of, yeah, I experience same-sex attraction, but it doesn't determine my direction. It doesn't determine my orientation. That is a word that I want to reclaim. What is orientation? Is sexual orientation whatever I feel? Or does it give homage to the design of my body, that's spousal by nature. And I think that's a better way. That's mm-hmm. a better starting point of saying, yes, I have confusing desires for sure, but I need to reconcile to who I am as a man. It's important to reconcile to who I am so that I can be a gift in my masculinity. So with that in mind, I want to tell you about an encounter I had with somebody who identified as gay and tell you if I got, you can tell me if I got this wrong or if this was insensitive. I had just gotten done giving a big presentation at a Steubenville conference, which mm-hmm. we have many all over the country mm-hmm. for this person's anonymity. And it was many years ago, uh, but he came up to me and, and he kind of like said, like, you know, I'm, I'm gay. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, sir, like, do you think you're special? You don't think I have to deal with shit all the time as well? <laughs> there was something in his eyes that I, I could trust that he would take that well. Sure, I would sure. just randomly right, throw right, that out right. with no, you know, and, and I gave him a hug and we, we had a great talk. Yeah. But, but is that kind of like, yeah, maybe that's a little too harsh. You no, tell me. I mean, it, I, I think, I don't need a violin to be playing when I when I say I experience same sex attraction, because I think leaving homosexuality in a way I know that that's kind of a way of saying it. Like I left homosexuality, which is great. I mean, amen for those of us who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, <laughs> Jesus is good to us. He helps us, but I think that's just the prelude of becoming, leaving behind a disordered way of living and saying, okay, what now? Yeah. I think I would have said that. Well, what now? I mean, you've come to grips with your experience of same-sex attraction. I wouldn't necessarily call myself gay because of it. But what now? How are you going to reckon with that? How are you going to integrate that experience of disordered sexuality, but actually become in and through it? How are you going to find the narrow way? Because you're still a man. You still have a potency of engendering life, of, of actually pursuing woman. You have to reckon with that as any Christian does, you know? So yes, and I think is always helpful. Yes, thank you for sharing that. What does that mean now? What does it mean in Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. He assumed a body so that we could be freed, not from ours, but for it. So there's something about my body as a man who experiences same-sex attraction. I do have a a temptation to bypass the demands of this body Mm -hmm. to pursue woman. But I have to reckon with that, you know? So I'm going to ask you some questions that might sound as insensitive as when Michael Scott said to Oscar in the office, (laughs) one day we could get together and you could tell me how you'd do that to another dude. (laughs) All right. So I don't mean to be insensitive, but I'm just trying to be honest. So like, what's the experience like, you know, when you kind of grew up, teenage years, you know, um, you, are you attracted? Were you, and maybe is the experience of people who would identify as gay that they do, I, they do find se- women sexually attractive and men, but men more so, mm-hmm. or is it kind of like how I grew up where I was like, I didn't find men sexually attractive at all. Uh, they may as well have been whatever. Yeah. Uh, and women very sexually attractive, like, or is it on a spectrum where? Yeah. You know, I, I think I found women appealing, you know, but not sexually attractive. Okay. You know, so as a kid early, late adolescent, high school, 
there was there was a locking into and i think an inner vow of i think i'm just gay Mm -hmm. you know and this is the direction i'm going but i know that that isn't wholly in line with the gospel so the priesthood i think is a good okay (laughs) why not why not just reject catholicism or or find catholics who would uh dismiss the teachings from the church and say no they're really optional the church is going to change the teaching so just live the gay lifestyle like why not why not make that option that's a good question i think i i think i just loved jesus too much like i i knew that i i trusted him and i knew i wanted to be his disciple and i think for me the seminary was saying okay lord i i think this is good i think this is a good way for me to live for you Okay. Even though it's, you say you love Jesus too much, but that would imply that you believed what the Catholic Church taught about homosexual acts. And I did. Why? I, oh, you did. I did. Yeah, I believe. I believed what the Church was saying. But I. Why, I, why did you believe that? Um. I I I think I saw the inherent disorder of it. That it was just a, de- a dead end. Okay. I think I knew from an early age, probably because of my upbringing, that sex was about babies, <laughs> and so if it wasn't leading to that, there was something off about it. I remember even as a kid being so convicted about the whole birth control thing, mm. like, oh, if sex is not about babies, then it's just gymnastics. <laughs> it's just kind of hedonist, you know. So taking the devil's advocate approach. And yet there are women, women who are infertile. And so if they're infertile, maybe they shouldn't be having sex with their husbands either. Is that what you're saying? No, I wouldn't say that. I would say that those who experience infertility in, in whatever ways, of course, there's there's still an openness to life. There's not there's not a, um, a sort of artificial means of, of withholding the gift, you know, mm-hmm. uh, of withholding self or or for, for men who ask their wives to, to use birth control to sort of stifle the system I because see. that's just an obstacle to our sexual pleasure. Mm-hmm. I think even those who experience a, a difficulty in conceiving, there's still an openness <laughs> kind of saying, okay, Lord, he, here it is. I, mm. I'm still offering myself. Yeah. The yeah. act at least says that. Of even course. Even if the intention of the partners don't. Yeah. Exactly. I think the act invites the creator. You know, you lose control without unencumbered by birth mm-hmm. control. You lose control with the other and in a way that invites mm-hmm. the creator in, mm-hmm. you know, it's beautiful. And I knew, I knew that from an early age, like, oh, to sort of stifle that is disordered. You know, there's something about that that isn't according to the plan of God. So did you have a lot of people really excited for you when you decided and announced you were joining the seminary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Like the, the my family was really excited. I mean, I grew up saying I was going to be a priest, so it was sort of like yeah. a, a foot in, you know. Yeah. And I did the strange thing of 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 looking at different seminaries, and I was attracted to the Philadelphia one, so mm-hmm. I went there, which is a, people don't usually do that. And I was accepted, Cardinal Regali at the time, and um, yeah, people were pumped. Mm-hmm. I was pumped, you know. But then when I entered. My excitement became a slight anxiety because it exacerbated my need f- to be known in this area that I, I wasn't known in, you know. Why did it exacerbate the need? Um, it, it sort of created an anxiety that I know I need to speak this out, <sighs> you know, yes. but I'm just not. So, for example, you asked about confession back as a kid. Yeah, I would confess like gay pornography, but behind the screen, I wasn't known in it. You know what I mean? Like Marco Casanova struggles in this way. Mm. I was never up to this point known in that. And I felt a tug from the Lord for years. Like you need to be known in this. This needs to come into the light. So it's to be integrated. You know, I need, I need to be known here. And there was a lot of wrestle and just, I'm not definitely not ever going to say that. (laughs) I, I just, I love that. It's so beautiful. It's so vulnerable. That place where the fear is, if you know me, you won't accept me. Yeah. And I will be alone, which I think is like our greatest fear. Oh my I'll gosh. I'll be left alone. Yeah. This this risk of being known, right? Mm. That's where it's courageous, I think, when people leave homosexuality. It's like you're you're you're, you're showing me an aspect of yourself that's very very vulnerable. You know? Yeah. And what's what's kind of ironic too is vulnerability is I think one of the one of if not the most beautiful of human traits. Mm. So when this fella came up to me at the Steubenville conference and announced to me that he was a gay Catholic, I found that beautiful because yeah. he was sharing something that to him looked ugly yes, and to me looked beautiful right? because it was just humility and vulnerability. Exactly. I think that's a beautiful way to look at it, Matt. Like 
these people are sharing something about themselves. And how do we respond? Mm. Do we respond disgruntled and, oh, they're wrecking our Catholic ethos? Yeah. Or is it an invitation to like, well, let me, sh- let me show you how Jesus has helped me or mm-hmm. redeemed me in my own sexuality. I mean, Matt, you're known for that. I remember going to a Steubenville conference as a high school student and hearing you and like, uh, whoa, this dude's leading out in his brokenness, kind of different yeah. than a lot of the other people I was hearing. Yeah, they were being vulnerable, but it was sort of nuanced to where it was I wasn't exactly sure what they were saying, I see. Like but I, you yeah. were just like, I'm, this, this is how I was addicted and this yeah. was the, the extent of it. And yeah. this is how Jesus saved me. I think we need that today in response to people who are saying, this, I think this is a part of me. Wouldn't it invite community yeah. to say, well, yeah, I struggle, maybe not like you, but similar. And Jesus helped me too. How many conferences would you say you went to prior to seminary, roughly? Like a, uh, two? I, I went like... to Steubenville like every year okay. as a high school student, so maybe like four. Now I know at Steubenville conference, they often talk about sexuality, yeah. right? Did you ever hear someone from stage say, and if you have same-sex attraction, look, you're so welcome by the church and we love you and you're not a freak. Like, did anyone ever say anything like that? They that did. Puts salve on the yeah. wounds? Good. But it kind of, it, it kind of made me cringe a little bit, you know, because okay. it, it wasn't, there was no direction for me. And I think I, I wanted see. direction. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, Jesus accepts me and the church accepts me. I, I thank you. You know, <laughs> now what? <laughs> now what? Cause I think a lot of people with same sex attraction are afraid that if they follow the church's teachings, they will be left alone, which mm-hmm. we've already agreed is the most terrifying prospect for humans. Right. And uh, yeah. I think I want what I wanted to hear. Uh, and this isn't to dog anybody who, you know, gives those talks. Yes and amen. <laughs> but what I wanted to hear is a, maybe a witness of somebody yeah. who has experienced being transformed by Jesus' mercy despite same sex attraction. You know, we need that. See, what you're talking about, I think, is an intimacy with Jesus that many Christians haven't yet encountered, Mm. right? And I see this too when I talk to people, let's say, who would identify as alcoholics or Mm. say they were addicted to alcohol and then went to a 12-step group and or their life fell apart and they had no other option. It's almost like to experience that deep intimacy of Jesus, yeah. I need to get to the place where I, it doesn't work anymore. I yeah. don't know how to make life work anymore. And then that kind of, that redemption goes down so deep that I can now speak from this transformed place. But I suspect that many Christians, maybe even Christians on stage or who lead podcasts like myself, haven't yet encountered that. And so the good news for us might be, well, it's good news when we die and go to heaven, mm-hmm. or it's good news that we know the truth yes. that the church teaches that other people need to know but it hasn't yet reached de- deep down into our personal pain. I, I agree with you. You know, I think to have the ethos is really important, but with no praxis of how to walk that out, mm. it's sort of an anorexic gospel. <laughs> it's lacking something. Jesus loves you in this brokenness, but not to provide avenues to experience the transforming love of God is burdensome. <laughs> It's like, okay, well, what now? Do I just sort of be good? Exist. Yeah. Try to screw up. I think there's more for us. And I'm eager. I mean, Desert Stream has been around for 43 years, so this isn't novel. But I think it's novel in the Catholic world, you know? I think it is fresh. There's something fresh about it. Like, whoa, Jesus can actually do this for persons. And it's not coercive, you know? that's. I think that's the main obstacle today the whole conversion therapy bans, all of this, like, is this coercive? Is this type of stuff coercive? Is it is it dangerous to be reconciled to one's nature, you know, and to actually be, be, be robustly alive in that, you know? Not uh, totally denying one's same-sex attraction, but learning how to integrate and, and to, to proceed on with the journey of giving and receiving. Is that dangerous? Well, I would say no. Reality is not dangerous. <laughs> this is just capital R reality. <laughs> this is this is why Jesus came to reconcile us to who we are. Become what you are, JP2 would say. And I think there's something about that in this whole arena, which I think is so important today, Matt. <laughs> We're in, a, in, in an incredible juncture in the life of the church right now, where if we don't get this right, if we don't get homosexually right, homosexuality right it 
it'll create such havoc in our church. I mean, the Protestant denominations have done this. <laughs> They've all folded to the whole homosexual question, you know, gay clergy, gay marriage. They've, they've absolutely lost any sort of anthropology. And I think in our history, we have to be utterly clear in who we are and what is ours by nature and what can the grace of Jesus help me be reconciled to. So how are we not getting it right? Um, I mean, I think the Catholic Church has a beautiful anthro. I think we have it. <laughs> I think we have the anthropology. I think we do. Like what, for those at home, what man is and is for? What do you mean by anthropology? Exactly. Who we are, who I am for her, who she is for me. Theology of the body. I think that's prophetic. I think what John Paul II did was a, prof, a, a, a certain prophetic call to humanity. It's still fresh today as I read it. Mm. It's not dated in the least. <laughs> He's reminding us of who we are. And it's, it's just a biblical anthropology. He's just using the, the Old and New Testament just to explain who we are. So I think the Catholic Church has it. Now, I think the question is, how do we appropriate it in our lives? How do we actually um, pastorally apply theology of the body? I would say living waters. It's an answer, not to mm -hmm. absolutize it, mm -hmm. you know. But Christopher West, for example, we've been partnering with him and his institute because mm. he, he believes living waters is the pastoral application of theology of the body. Mm. You read this tome of human love and it's so incredible and then you're like how do i how do i do this <laughs> i love it it sounds great how do i actually mm. live this you know and i think every christian is invited into that no matter your starting point so i want to say thank you to hello which is the best not just the best catholic app on the app store any app store it's the best app out of any app that's ever existed catholic or otherwise i think it's finally time to say that if you want to grow in your prayer life please check out hello.com slash matt if you sign up on their website at hello.com slash matt you can get the entire app for free for 90 days. That's ridiculous. After those 90 days, if you don't agree with me that it's worth the, the money that you're gonna get charged after that monthly, which is a relative, relatively small amount, you can just cancel, you won't be charged a cent. They have sleep stories. They have My Catholic Lo-Fi on there. They've just added the Gospels, a dramatized version of the Gospels. They have daily exegesis on mass readings, which you can listen to. It is fantastic. So if you haven't done it already, hello.com slash Matt, sign up over there try it for free for three months so would you mind unless it's too personal sharing with me when you started to act out in seminary maybe mm -hmm. what was the what was the impetus for that and the shame around that and mm -hmm. whatever else yeah i mean being in philadelphia I was pr pretty far away from home and i remember getting to the point of in my own ad addiction to pornography that acting out homosexually seemed like wow that i could do that mm -hmm. and and i can accommodate it you know i can sort of sanitize it, you know, gay massages that lead into sexual acts with other men in a way I, I thought, well, it's not necessarily right. Right. Like I'm not out. Mm -hmm. I'm not, there was a, there was a very weird, I would say split from myself where I was trying to accommodate these ways of, of soothing mm -hmm. my pain, soothing my, my feelings of, of being inadequate as a man, you know, and, and in a way I, I started to act out rebelliously in that, but in the dark, you know, cassocked and good on the outside, but in the inside, really, really broken and disintegrated. And it was there that I, I think it was maybe about 18 months that I pursued that. Mm. And it was something that I would, I would go to this Jesuit and confess behind the screen. And mm -hmm. he was amazing. I remember, I, you know, we, we became friends, but I remember the first time I acted out and I went to confession, he said, you know, you're going to want to do that again. And you just have to be aware of that. And I thought, I'm never going to do that again. Right. Cause the shame is so palpable. The, the shame. I was in tears. There was mm. something about it that was so, I couldn't believe that I had crossed the threshold right. that I never thought I'd cross. And this, this Jesuit father, Martin Tripoli, beautiful man. Um, he said, you're going to want to, you're going to want to do that again, but I'll walk with you. You know, bless him. You gotta, you gotta, you, you gotta get some self mastery. I didn't really take him up on it at first. I did later, but I thought, no, 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 no. It's uh, I'm, I'm done. 
you know, I'll delete the apps, I'll, I'll, I'm out, you know. But then I realized, oh, whoa, I opened a door in my life that I'm, I'm going to need help. I'm, I'm going to need help closing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it, it led me down a lot of dodgy, vacant, uh, attitudes in the seminary. I think I was showing up, so to speak, to class and chapel and I was confessed and cleansed, but in a way I had subjugated the confession to my own addictive acting out. It was just a part of the cycle, Yeah, you know, go behind the screen, feel pretty good. And then a week later I'm in the same boat, you know, Mm. I needed help. I needed a deep reckoning there. And so I, when I was on this spirituality year, um, I remember going on this 30 day retreat and I couldn't be silent because everything was confessed, but I wasn't again known, especially by the seminary community. Like I needed, I needed them to know me, Mm -hmm. you know, I felt like I was withholding something from formation, from these priests who were in charge of saying yes to my advancement, you know? Mm -hmm. And the third day in, I remember I thought, I can't, I can't do this. Like I either leave the 30 day retreat or I confess all of everything I've done to a priest. So I did. And it, that catapulted me into a, a conversion. How did this confession differ from the one to the Jesuit? And, and why did this cap? Is it because he was part of your formation program? Yeah, it was. There was something about that that had a gravitas. You know, it was. How does that work as one uh, is in seminary? I know it's part of the private forum mm-hmm. and the priest can't share this presumably with the person who's in charge of forming you. How how does that work? So for me, this, this guy was in charge of the spiritual formation of the seminary. So he was internal forum to use that language. So, but there was something that I wasn't even known to the internal form of the seminary. I didn't trust that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't want to be known by anybody who had a hand in my advancement, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I, I came to grips with my need to be known to this man. And, and I felt a real invitation from the Lord. Like I, I need to just lay it out. I need to tell him who I, what I, what I'm experiencing and who I am, you know? And it was there that I, I started to pivot, you know, and this 30 day became a, a saving grace for me. I'm grateful for that. And the subsequent years became um, restorative, you know, I started, I never acted out again, wow. which was a grace from the Lord. But then I had, a, I had a lot of other stuff to deal with. <laughs> mm. Pornography, masturbation, um, fantasy life, yeah. codependency, a lot of, st- I, had a, I had a lot of stuff to unfold before the Lord and I needed help. And that's when I started really utilizing everything that the seminary could give me, spiritual directors and therapists. Mm who helped me look into this. My first therapist wasn't super helpful. (laughs) He wanted me just to sort of acclimatize myself to my gay self. And so I, I knew enough at that point, like, okay, this isn't, this isn't going to work. I need somebody with a little bit more of a, of a grip on Catholic understanding. So I went to this woman therapist and she was amazing. She was able to help me see that my same sex attraction had meaning that needed Mm. mining therapeutically, that this was emblematic of a wound. She gave me a template that I had never experienced before. And she got out her little therapeutic scalpel, so to speak, and was able to help me navigate areas of the terrain of my soul. And I needed guidance here. Um, I remember sensing um, a deep shame that I wanted to cultivate a desire um, for woman not necessarily going into the direction of marriage, but I, I wanted to see woman as woman because I had so forfeited that in my homosexual pursuits. And I remember her um, showing me the homosexual attraction was so high octane, so jazzed. <laughs> and this desire for woman was, was, was new. It was new muscle for me. And she, was, she helped me to just, just to reckon with that and just to be patient with myself, wow. you know? To sort of let this one, let this one go, Marco. This one doesn't ennoble you. <laughs> it's compelling, but it's not ennobling. You know, it doesn't doesn't really fulfill the design of of your nature. But this one, cultivate this one, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, it'll just cultivate 
It was so helpful for me just to sit in that office and just allow her wisdom and her guidance to to help me in these areas where I I mean celibate priest didn't help me. <laughs> yeah. You know, they cleansed me from my sin, you know, and they helped me to to be okay in the Lord, but I also needed the psychotherapeutic to I heard somebody say if we were a little more curious and a little less condemning of our sins, we might make a great deal more advancement. It mm-hmm. sounds like that was what she was doing. Like, how about we look at this? Right. Yeah. How how do we see this? Yeah. How do we integrate this? That was her big pursuit. How do we integrate this? Because you're a man and my task as a therapist and as a therapist for the seminary is to to give you all of the resource you need, at least in her wherewithal, to be effectively mature enough to say, I'm called to be a celibate for the kingdom of God. And if I haven't reckoned with woman, if I can't renounce the good of marriage for the sake of the kingdom, I see. I'm not ready to be a priest. So we had a task at hand. I was just a, a couple years away from diaconate, which is when a man will promise celibacy to the bishop. So I knew I, there, there, was a, there was an end here that I needed to, to come to grips with. And that was very helpful for me, but I still felt under a low ceiling, like I was just gay, frankly. I felt like these desires in me were still very strong and still not incredibly integrated. And I took, I postponed diaconate ordination. I asked Chaput if I could take a year off and live in a parish. And then my great friend, Father Brian Kane, who's a priest of Lincoln, I said, he was my formator at the time, and he, everyone knew everything about me at this point. I had come into the light, even with the bishop. Like I, I'm like, this guy's going to lay hands on my head. Mm. He needs to know who I am. So at what point did you first share this struggle with somebody outside of the confessional or the psychologist's office? Yeah, what good was question. Like? So uh, I had a friend in the seminary, Father Sean Kerr, who's a priest of Arlington, Virginia, a great guy. Uh is about the time that this book by James Martin, Building a Bridge, came out. Mm-hmm. So I was reading it, and uh, mm. I had a lot of things to say about it. And I was taking him to a doctor's appointment. And he broke his leg or something, and we were in the car. And I'm pretty, I was pretty impassioned by it. And he just stops me. He's like, "Wait, do you do you struggle with same sex attraction?" And I was like, "Oh my gosh! Like, who asks that? You know, <laughs> like, were you raised by wolves?" And I'm like, yeah, I do, you know? Mm. And that was the first time that I had kind of come into the light with my friends, you know? That was kind of a different level for me. Mm. But then I was like, yo, Sean, I don't need a therapist. I need a friend. So Mm. if I'm going to be vulnerable, I need you to reciprocate it, you know? (laughs) Like, let's let's kind of do this together. And then we formed a Yezu Caritas group in the seminary. And we we kind of really ran with the whole vulnerability thing. What is Yezu Caritas? So it's like a it, it, typically priests who gather together and it's it's faith sharing, vulnerable, mm. vulnerable sharing groups for seminarians and priests. Mm. And it's a wonderful model of coming together. We would come together every Wednesday morning and and just share where we're at with, with whatever we're struggling with, be it with moral mm. stuff or um, whatever, whatever the case was. So that was when I, I started to come into the light and Sean, Sean was a firecracker for me. He was, he was really helpful. And he's like, yo, you should tell Shep Hugh. And I thought that is the last thing I would ever do. But I thought I kind of let it simmer. And I, know, I know why, but tell us why that's the last thing you would have ever done. Well, because I mean, you, you, then you're really kind of, <laughs> it was, I was so scared, you know, like, that could mean I'd be kicked out of the seminary, right. you know, but in a way he was right. It, it is. If you want to give this to Jesus, then, then give it to his members, especially the members in your direct care who have a say over your life. Mm. I believed it. But when I first heard it, I was super not into it. I thought, but I'll put it on the back burner, you know, and yeah. if it catches fire, I'll do it. I'm that kind of person. You know, if somebody challenges me, I may be defensive at first, but if, if it if it resonates, I'll mm. I'll walk I'll walk with it. So I did, and I met with Chapu and laid it all out. And he asked me important questions, and it gave me a new freedom, you know, to to walk with a clarity that these men knew me, you know. And at this point, I had made significant progress in my integration, but there was a personal feeling like I was still just under this low ceiling, Father Sean Kilcall, oh, sorry. What does that mean? 
I, I like it. Is it just you felt constricted or? I didn't feel free in my sexuality. I didn't feel free enough to say, yes, I can renounce the good of marriage for the sake of the kingdom of God. I was still allergic to the idea of marriage. I couldn't even conceptualize myself actually being a good husband, mm -hmm. you know, giving myself to a woman that was so foreign to me. At this point, I, I desired marriage, but I didn't think that was enough. It wasn't just an emotional accommodation. I wanted to feel it in my bones. Like, oh no, I made for this, but I'm going to renounce the good of this yeah. to follow Jesus in this particular way for the sake of his kingdom. And Father Sean Kilcalli said, hey, there's this ministry out in Kansas City. This guy, Andrew Kamiski, he really believes Jesus can do transformative work on the level of sexual brokenness. And I, I heard that and I, I knew a little bit about Andrew because I had read his book, Strength and Weakness. It was a part of our psychology course in the seminary, recommended reading. And I was like, oh yeah, I know, I know what that is. But it, it struck me as all evangelical and I was a little allergic to that. Like, oh, what do I do with a evangelical Pentecostal ministry? Mm. You know, like, I don't know how to do that, you know? So, but I thought I've risked much to sin. Hmm. I can risk now to be healed, you know? And if this is it, I'm on this pastoral year. I'm, I'm discerning. I'm, this is November of this 2018 pastoral year. And I'm discerning, am I going to proceed on? And I needed to utilize everything given to me. So I came to this Living Waters retreat. We do, uh, it's called the Living Waters Leadership Training. We do three a year. And there's always, there's always room for people who want personal healing. And that was me. I wasn't coming to lead Living Waters or even think about becoming an ambassador of Living Waters. I just needed some answers, you yeah. know? So I came and I remember looking at the main room and there was the Divine Mercy I thought, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. The evangelicals like divine mercy. I like that. And then Andrew was at mass the next morning and he went up for communion. And I thought, oh, we don't like, we don't enter commune, but I'm here. I'm just going to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just going to be open and, and, and receptive. And what I, uh, Andrew got up that next day and he said, today is my favorite feast day. And I thought, Surely he's a Catholic because it was the feast of the dedication of the Basilica of St. John Lateran. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Only a Catholic can actually like that. And that's and he, what he was referring to? Yeah, oh, exactly. Wow. He loves the Ezekiel passage of the water just overflowing mm. from the temple. And that's when I knew he was a Catholic. He talked about his conversion okay. to Catholicism. It was all falling into place for me. I thought, okay, I'm not just in the hands of, of evangelicals, which I love now, but now I'm in the hands of people who understand John Paul II theology of the body, the divine mercy, all so, of it. So threatened. it was an evangelical ministry, but the fella who leads it was a Catholic. It was just more ecumenical. Or? Yeah. So now it's more of an ecumenical expression, you know, mm. founded in, uh, Jesus movement, California, oh, you see. know, 1980. Um, but now it's, it's, it's become what it is now. And, and largely the, the whole, all of the materials are our theology of the body. Okay. So for me, that was important. I needed, I needed to be, I needed to feel like I was at home in something, like I could track with this. And this week, I felt broke that low ceiling. It gave me vision. I was able mm -hmm. to kind of stand erect and see beyond my fracture. Yeah, I was able to see a new horizon for my sexual humanity that I had never seen before because these witnesses of men and women who come out of this stuff we're saying, oh no, Jesus has helped me and this is how he's continuing to help me. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm living with same-sex attraction, but uh, how I'm, I'm learning how to be a good gift for my wife. I'm hearing these testimonies and it's breaking the domination of homosexuality in my life. It no longer called the shots for me. It no longer was holding me, the roadmap. I was able to see beyond what I, I, couldn't, I, I hadn't seen before. And so I immediately went back to Kansas City and I left the seminary because I knew I needed to give Jesus more space to do integrative work in my life. I knew I needed to, to let go of the seminary, not because I didn't want to be a priest, but because I knew I just didn't have the wherewithal yet. Maybe I did. Maybe I, maybe I could develop that, but I, mm. needed, I needed Jesus to get in more. And, and I knew letting go of the seminary was a necessity for me at this point. So I, I came on as an intern to Desert Stream and then, um, yeah, been there since and now I'm full time. So, Okay. And wh how, did you, how did you leave the seminary? So I just wrote a letter and said, I'm okay. leaving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, 
They were <laughs> it's good. All right. Yeah, it's just quite, quite <laughs> did, did simple. You, did you get the sense that other men in the seminary struggled with same-sex attraction? Did that yeah. ever come up? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, it certainly came up. I, I think... Do you ever think about, forgive the intense question, the damage you could have caused if you had to become a priest and never reconciled this sort of stuff? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's what... Uh, part of that was why it catapulted me out, you know? Yeah. And I want to be a saint. Let's be honest. I want to be a saint. And I think healing is an essential part of the Christian mission. Mm. Jesus came to reconcile us. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I wasn't going to take that seriously, Jesus would still love me, you know, but I wasn't actually inviting Jesus to redeem everything about me. If I was still even holding on to this gay thing. And as right. a priest, there was still something that I wasn't giving the Lord. Yeah. And I, if you would have become a priest. Yeah, yeah, it would have locked me in, I think, in a way that... How did, did you explain this? Helpful. When did you explain this to your family? Because obviously they know or she wouldn't be on my channel talking about this so openly. So how <laughs> Dang did, it, mom doesn't know. <laughs> no, she does. Uh, I, I would say uh, when I left the seminary, they didn't know. And then that Easter, following Easter, so I left in, in January of 2019. And that Easter of 2019, I sat my family down and I, gave, I just kind of gave them what Jesus was doing in my life. Mm. And that, how did that happen? How did that go? Uh, it was, it was great. I, I told they, my, did they have the language of what the Lord is doing in my life? Cause you said they were Catholic, but yeah. maybe not in that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think they, they would like to have that language, you know, yeah. and they're, they're good hearted. I think they received me in the best way that they could, which was enough. You know, I needed, I needed to tell them because I was becoming a part of this ministry and mm. I wanted, I wanted them to know, it was important for them to know my process and why, why I left the seminary and why that at this point, I, I felt like I wasn't going back mm -hmm. to the seminary, you know? So yeah, it was Good Friday. We did like a prayer group, which the Casanovas never do. Mm -hmm. But I told my sister, I was like, hey, can we get the family together and do like a, a prayer devotional? And she's like, I love it. Let's do it. So she gathered the family and uh, I, ga I, I gave up my spiel and yeah, since then, it, we, we talk about it every once in a while, you know, just revisiting that. Um, I think it's a process for them too. Like, how do we reconcile this in in terms of he's no longer a priest? I think it's easier for my immediate family, but my extended family, I'm sure they're like, what? what is Mark, what's, minist what's the Desert Storm? Uh -huh. Working for Desert Storm Ministries, you know? Like and how, how was it talking about same-sex attraction? And like, yeah, I think for, for me, it was... It, the op the mere openness to my family was, um, it was vulnerable. It was hard, you know. What would have been harder, telling them that or telling them that you had a pornography addiction? Mm. Telling them that I think yeah. was harder for me, you know. Were they accepting of it, and of you, more importantly? Yeah, they were. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and they 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 gave me a, a good, a good space to just talk it out. They had questions, which were great, great questions. Some of them were more silent than others and that's mm -hmm. okay. You know, mm -hmm. again, I don't know what's going on in their hearts, the template in which they're receiving this. Yeah. I think we're all different. I'm definitely more versed in it than they are. And I have to know that, you know, they don't have to receive me like a, a master therapist, you know? Right. Yeah. So you, you sound like you don't like people necessarily referring to themselves as gay Christians. Can you help us understand gay versus same-sex attracted and why some language might be more preferable to others? Yeah, I, I think um, that's a good question. I think when you assume the the label of gay, I think it's, it's putting um, a low ceiling on yourself. I think it is saying something conclusive about your nature, about your sexuality. And I think that's important that we steer away from that mm -hmm. because the one, once we put sort of that ad, those adjectival qualifiers on it, it sort of makes it something else. Yeah. If I'm a gay Catholic, that means that I'm, I'm no longer in the world of reckoning with woman. You know, I've, I've kind of stalled in my need or in my adventure to reckon with her good. Well, Okay, what does that mean? Because why can't somebody have same-sex attraction, call themselves a gay Catholic, and reckon with a woman, but not in the sense of wanting to date her or marry her? Well, I what does it mean to reckon with a woman? I think it means to to see 
ourselves as gift and to see her as gift and not to put a cap on that. I think putting gay on it mm, qualifies it, you know, and in a way it's sort of determinative. It's saying, I, I'm not really going there. I've determined that I'm not going to get married because of this. And I, I think I would challenge and say, well, are you sure? Are you sure? What, what, what makes you so sure that you're not called to that? Hmm. To give yourself as gift. So do you differ with some other Catholics who've lived homosexual lifestyles in, in this regard? I, I probably would. Yeah. yeah. And could you break open that difference for us so it's real clear for folks at home? I like integration. I like the language of integration. I like the language of chastity as seen in the catechism mm -hmm. where it's an integration of our spiritual and corporeal bodily reality. I like that language. I think it's equal ground for those of us who struggle with sexual and relational brokenness. So in the language of integration, as I'm integrating in who I am as man, made in the image of God, not just man, but man and woman in the image of God, I have to reckon with her in order to take my place. I still don't know what that means. As an image bearer. Reckon with her. Um, I have to see her as she is, as... As woman who's able why, to receive my pursuit. I, I don't understand that either. Why can't I just recognize her as a good, but a good that I don't want? Like, I don't have to reckon with every woman in the world to be faithful to my wife and to give myself to her fully. For sure. No, it's a good question. I think it's important for those of us who ex to experience same-sex attraction to, to not go out of the game of relating to woman based on the proclivity. So if somebody says, I've had same-sex attraction ever since I was a kid, lived in the homosexual lifestyle, I'm now a faithful Catholic, I've repented of that, do you think they should be open to marrying a woman? What about those who say, I'm just not attracted to women, and that doesn't mean I'm not integrated, I'm just, uh, I don't experience that, and so I'm going to be celibate? Yeah, I think, I think that's okay to come to that, yeah. you know? I think that's okay to say, I'm called to be a celibate for the kingdom of God. But I think that necessitates uh, hard work of integration, you know? What does that mean? Ines hard work of... A reckoning, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm using words that, of, of getting, of, of, of asking the hard questions of, am I dodging woman because I see. I'm threatened by her. So maybe people too quickly dismiss the possibility of one day being married or being attracted to woman. I, I think so. I mean, I've met yeah. wonderful people in Courage who aren't married, yeah. who've been at it for years, decades, mm. chase living for Jesus. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But I think they've reckoned with... <laughs> They've come to grips. Okay. The other doesn't threaten them. Okay. I think for those of us who struggle with same-sex attraction, woman threatens me at times, right? I mean, woman threatens me at times. Sure. I think that's the equal ground that I'm speaking okay. about, you know? It certainly threatens Thursday. <laughs> so, <laughs> you laughed. I had to say that. Disavow. <laughs> yeah. gonna, I, I'm praying for a bride for him. Mm. Um, good. Thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure he appreciates that. I appreciate that. that. <laughs> yes. Um, what are your thoughts on, con what is conversion therapy and mm. what do you think about it? Hmm. I mean, I think, I think conversion therapy is kind of a, a catch all these days for any effort for a person who experiences same sex attraction to, to maybe launch into opposite sex relating. Mm hmm. So whether that's therapeutically or, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of, I think a straw man, <laughs> frankly, for, for efforts of, of people to choose yeah. the direction that they want to go is in. Is a therapist free to lead somebody in what is sometimes called conversion therapy? I mean, yeah. I, I think the question is, what, is, what do we mean by conversion therapy? Okay. You know, is it good talk therapy about being reconciled to one's uh, biological gender. Well, at a base level, isn't it? I'm attracted to dudes and I don't want to be. Yeah. And, and, and for me, I think therapeutically, I think a person has freedom to choose that and to say, I, I have conflictual feelings and mm. I want to learn how to live with those, not be so allergic to those, maybe um, having a therapeutic goal in mind. You know, maybe I, I, maybe I am threatened by my coworkers who are women and I want to. I want to be. I want to be good with them. And How do you think you were threatened by women in a way that I wasn't? I know you don't know me, and that's an unfair question. But I. I just think like I think a lot of men are threatened by the the beauty, the elusiveness, the mm. mystery of woman. Yeah. <laughs> um, and maybe that's why a lot of us turn to pornography because it's just easier. I don't have to deal with the mystery. Mm. I just get the 
whatever the 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 soulless body i get the yeah you know um so do you think how do people with same-sex attraction struggle with women in a way maybe that men don't in the way that we're kind of touching on i think for me i can only speak for myself i don't really yeah. know i think everyone's story is so different especially yeah. with those with same-sex attraction so i i hope not i i don't want to sound like i'm absolutizing sure, my sure. my template of mm -hmm. freedom and healing um but i think for me it was can i actually dignify her uh sexually you what know? does that mean dignify like, her? i think there was a deep 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 desire to be man enough to actually marry i think there was that in me you know like oh my gosh that was so attractive to me in the best sense when i saw marriage it was like whoa but i think the threat was can i actually show up for her yeah. am i man enough and when you say show up for her, do you mean to please her sexually, to provide for her, to all of the children, above, all that, <laughs> you yeah. know, be yeah. roused by her, yeah, to protect her, yeah, to speak for her, okay, to hold her, to to lead her. Um, that was a threat to me, you know, because it was it a was threat because you've. I'm, I, I apologize if I'm inter interjecting no, too much. I no, love what okay. you're saying. I'm trying to understand it. So, is it a threat in the sense of? the idea of it makes me feel emasculated like because i i don't have what it takes other people do i don't so therefore I'm, i can't go there because uh, so I, I, I it's the fight or flight so i yeah. have to fly i have to flee yeah from this threat that is calling something from me that i do not possess even though you do but the fear is that you don't possess it, it that's exactly right it was ter it was new terrain that i hadn't walked into mm -hmm. and that was threat that was threatening for yeah. me you know um but i'm grateful i'm grateful for I mean, the whole healing community, you know, who's who's helped me to sort of see my wherewithal to be a good gift to woman mm -hmm. and to actually pursue a woman, to love a woman well, you know. I remember, so I, I met my wife in, in Vadovice and we did the long distance thing. And I remember going to visit her for the first time in Krakow. Um, it, this was a couple months after we made it official that we were dating and feeling a lot of anxiety about, well, I want to kiss her. I want... I want to show up for her. I want to, I want to feel for her. There was other women that I had dated a little bit that mm -hmm. I didn't feel that, you know? So I was worried because if I'm not, if I don't feel for her, then I'm not going to pursue her. Mm -hmm. Not to say that that's everything, but that's an important component. It's you something. Know? It's something, <laughs> especially for someone like me, who's going, you know, 30 on 13 in the world of women. Like I'm, this was new for me. Mm -hmm. You know, this was kind of my first real relationship was there a point in your healing journey that you thought okay i'm going to be really open to pursuing woman and pursuing marriage like was that a milestone for you yeah it was can you tell me how that happened so when i left the seminary that's why i left okay they gave me the option of sort of leave of absence mm -hmm. but i wanted i wanted to get into the world of woman <laughs> We're going to make that a short, uh, just clip that out. I feel like a woman. <laughs> no, I definitely, I wanted, I wanted freedom to, yeah. to step into that. I never stepped into that, you know? Yeah. So it's important that I do that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what I've experienced with my now wife, um, was it miraculous? Was it natural? I think it's probably a little bit of both, you know, having good, good feelings for her, you know, feelings that are. Uh, appropriate. I felt that they were natural, you know, and I could go somewhere with, with those. I could, it wasn't the end, but it, it certainly was important data <laughs> for me in discerning this woman that I, I grew to love. Do you still have same sex attraction? It's not like that just vanishes when you make a decision for a woman. Yeah, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I still do. I have to, I, I, I'm a struggler, you know, but is it, how is it, how is your struggle different to say any other married man struggle who finds other people attractive and needs to be careful and needs to be on guard, needs to watch the motions of his heart as he yeah. gets close to somebody. I think it's I'm sure in some ways it's the same. I and, think it's the same. Matt, okay. You know, I think it's, it's just, um, important mm -hmm. to keep an inventory or a, keep a, a watchful eye. You know, I, I have good friends who know me and who pray with me when I need that, you know, I mean, do I wish I I didn't have same sex attraction? I don't really go there. Like, I met Jesus powerfully because of it. Yeah, I once sat in front of the Blessed Sacrament and thanked God that I was exposed to pornography, and I thanked Him for all the sins I'd ever committed. Not because um, 
because through them I came to him. Wow. And through him, yeah. Not because I'm rejoicing in the sin which hurts him. Yeah. I don't want to hurt him and I don't want to act irrationally. Yeah. People are going to misunderstand this already, I can tell. But <laughs> but I think those who are a little bit more spiritually in mm. tune will get it. Mm-hmm. To be able to sit before the Lord and say, thank you for everything that you've permitted to happen. Yeah. Because it has all brought me here to you, you know? It's kind of a wound that keeps on giving in a way for me. You know, it's it, I, I bump up against it mm. and I go to the, I'm able to go to the Lord you know, and I'm, I'm able to integrate more, become more of who I'm called to be because of it, if that makes sense. Say that last bit again, you're able to become more of you. Because of it. Yeah. Because okay. I, I, I can come before the Lord and, and fellows uh, and, mm. and say, okay, uh, this, I, I'm feeling this and yeah. I, I know who I am. You know, it doesn't surprise me. No surprise. <laughs> oh mm. my gosh, I lost my healing because I have a homosexual thought. I'm not I don't really think like that, you know, Yeah. but it's more of a way of saying, okay, Jesus, come, come Lord. Uh, in a way of, I love that, like sitting before the Eucharist and just allowing the Lord to, to meet me. Yeah. I remember when I got married, um, we were, came back from our honeymoon and I had an experience of feeling a lot of like just strong same sex attraction. Probably wanted to check out with pornography. Mm-hmm. And I was, I remember just feeling like, oh, like, we're still in the honeymoon phase and this is kind of robbing me. My wife wanted to go to this Eucharistic adoration event and and so we did and there was something there was something so beautiful about just sitting before the host and allowing Jesus to just be with me in that and assume the shame of that assume the the I, I was kind of pissed off and maybe slightly you know rude because of it you know how we get when we feel tempted and yeah. it's just disruptive to our plans but in a way it it opened me to jesus who's who cleansed me initially from all of this it reminds me of paul to the corinthians like uh such were some of you but mm. you've been cleansed you know and he names homosexuality and that whole mm. litany but such were some of you but you've been cleansed so just to position myself and to be cleansed again I mean, I had no felonies to confess. There yeah. was no mortal sins, but there was like this, this, this experience of a pool mm. that gave me a reason to come before the Eucharistic Lord and say, "Okay, Lord, here I am. Help me." I think it's beautiful. I like. I, I I need that in my life, you know. And frankly, I wouldn't have met Anya, my wife, if it wasn't for same-sex attraction. You know. How is that the case? Well, because we met in the Living Waters world. She does live, she did Living Waters in Poland, mm. um, not because she comes from any same sex stuff. She has her own brokenness. Um, but we left, we, we, we met on this, this ground of Living Waters, you know? And so, in a way, the Lord brought me to her through this wound. <laughs> mm. Strange. Yeah, we, uh, this is, this is so beautiful. Whenever I meet somebody who I'll give a talk and a couple might come up to me and say they've been in going through SA or they've been through marriage counseling or I was an alcoholic or mm-hmm. these kind of things. I always think, oh, I bet you are someone I want to talk to because you're someone who knows who they are mm-hmm. or has experienced something that they ha- hate about themselves and have had to reconcile that and come to accept themselves in Christ. Um, there's a depth there, you know, and mm-hmm. I, I, I feel sorry for those who haven't yet maybe run smack into their own impotency. And so it's like, what do you bring to the Lord? Yeah. It's like, well, I get impatient at traffic lights. Oh yeah, but go into that. <laughs> like, what, what is that? Where does that come from? You yeah. know, it's like, well, no, it's yeah. just impatient at traffic lights. It's like, there's a shallowness there. And I think, yeah, the Lord, as I, we've kept saying, the Lord wants to get down deep into those parts of ourselves that we hate about ourselves and uh, to meet us there to, yeah. I'm still doing that. Like, I'm not Me great too. at that, you know? <laughs> As, I don't know what it is. Maybe as a dude, I'm not so mm. connected to my emotions. I love how women are, uh, the women I'm around at the office, um, they cry so beautifully at like things that are worthy of it. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to shed a tear. But it, mm. it, it does, you know, I'm, I'm still working that. Like, how do I go into the lower terrain of my mm. soul? How do I get into it's the nice lower register? It. And and just be present there. Um, I, I I want that. Lord, help me, <laughs> help me do that. Help me to reckon with my wounds and to to feel them and to 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 allow them to to affect me. You know. So I hear you, brother. 
When you encounter people in Living Waters or Desert Stream, what's the difference again, real quick? So one Desert Stream headquarters, uh, Kansas City, okay. many expressions of Living Waters throughout the world. Okay. Do you encounter people who come to you just completely hopeless? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure we're going to talk about my wounds and my childhood, but you don't understand. Like, yeah. none of this is going to help me, really. Oh, absolutely. There was a, a guy that comes to mind who came to a, a group that we did, and uh, he came in and he was he was in a, in a really low place and he slightly suicidal, you know, but was seeing a therapist. He was getting help in those areas. Um, but he needed, he needed hope. He, has, he was sort of slothful in his porn mm -hmm. addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't struggle with same sex attraction, mm -hmm. but porn addiction, a uh, Latin mass guy. So he was a little allergic to the whole, can we lay hands on you and pray? You know, <laughs> yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and we were, we were patient with him and I saw a change in him. Like Jesus was able to break through, through the power of just members praying for him simply, you know, we utilize something called listening prayer in living waters where it's really a lot of silence. And we just ask the Holy spirit to speak to us, give us words, give us images for this one. It's no advice. It's not advice giving. Mm -hmm. It's just saying, okay, Lord, this person has expressed their need. Come, come Holy spirit, mm -hmm. come and, and, and encounter this one. We stand with him today and the Lord encountered him. Now he's, a, he's, he's about to leave for mission in Ireland, but it was just amazing what the Lord did through this. It was a, a, another program that we do cross current, but then he did living waters and, and it, 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 it broke through the spirit of death in his life. There was something in his life that was, that was gripping him because of his struggle. And Jesus gave him hope in, in that very place. Mm -hmm incredible you know and of course that's a that's a wonderful story i think a lot of people who come to living waters it's not like a one time and you get every all the integration you need and it's like well, see you don't need your money back you you, you got it all right it's more yeah. like this is such a courageous life mm. i i remember when i went to therapy for the first time for all sorts of things you know anger and stuff like that there was like the temptation that, what am I doing? Like, this mm -hmm. is pathetic. I'm here on this couch talking to this frigging dude. Yeah. Like, and then, and then the good part of me <laughs> mocked the bad part of me. <laughs> and the good part of me said, oh, yeah, like way better just to stuff your feelings down and like watch football and masturbate and like not give a shit about anybody and not open your heart to your children and just stuff. Mm -hmm. it. Yeah, do that. That yeah. sounds like a winning <laughs> ticket. It's like what most people are doing, huh? Yeah. Um, it's like, and then I realized, oh yeah, that's stupid. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I want to live this deep life with its joys and sorrows. Yeah. As, and I want to choose that over a surfacey, shallow life where I pretend everything's fine. Exactly. But I'm gradually dying. Yeah. And I, I, this is why I love the world of living waters is because a, the gentleman, like I just um, described, he, he knows his limp. He knows where the enemy can catch him. He knows that he's prone to despair. He knows that he, he needs more magnanimity mm -hmm. in his life, you know? Praise God, now he knows. He, he, it doesn't take away the limp, but he walks with it uh, with, with more insight and, yeah. and a sp an inspired uh, authority now, you know? And he, he now doesn't have the shame to ask somebody for prayer and to help ask people for help, you know? So in that way, it's beautiful to see the progression of how people walk these areas out in their life, various areas mm -hmm. out in their life. It's an exhausting thing to continually repent of something you know you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> it's, it's, it just yeah. leads to a kind of hopelessness where you think, God, I just, I just hate myself. Yeah. This, this, what the hell is wrong with me? You know, a lot of people think that. And of course, one path out of that is to say, well, there's nothing wrong with me. Like yeah. this is perfectly natural and it's the church who's wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, I, I have a lot of, I, I'm think as you say that, Matt, I think of a lot of people that I know who are in the grips of, let's say, I, the people I'm thinking of are people who struggle with same-sex attraction and who don't have community around them, mm -hmm. you know, who don't have an empowered community to help them. If we have a fella or a lady who has same-sex attraction right now and they're watching this, and they have no community, can they reach out to your group? Yeah. How, what does that look like? How exactly can they do that? Yeah. I mean, you can, you can email me, mcasanova at desertstream.org. Put that in Thursday. It's 
Buckle up. Yeah. You're going to get d- a thousand Please, emails. please. And I'll, I'll try Bless my you. best to connect you. I mean, that's why we exist. You know, like you're not alone. Mm. Jesus has more for all of us. Yes, come, come and, and experience what Jesus has for you. This is why living water is obviously John four, the Samaritan woman. I love that. I love that image of this woman who has a lot going on <laughs> and this merciful Jesus comes and he, he, he shifts the atmosphere. He changes everything for her, you know? And I think that's what living waters is. That's what we are desert stream. It's like, okay, you don't have to get tidy up to come, come experience what God has for you. There's, there's more for you. That's what I would say. And, and it doesn't, it, my story doesn't have to be your story. You know, it's not this weird thing of now I have to uh, sort of acclimatize myself to being married. It's like, no, that's, that's not the point. The point is you're a gift. Do you know that? You're a good gift in your sexuality. Do you actually know that? Because Jesus has come to, to reconcile us to that good gift. Mm. So come. I th- imagine somebody saying, all right, I want to repent of this stuff. And I keep going to this over and over and over again. And they go to somebody like, I don't know, someone who's familiar with sort of therapeutic language. And maybe that person says to them, well, what you really need to do is you need to go deeper. You need to like bring th- this these these things to the Lord and mm. look at your woundedness or whatever. Mm-hmm. And all of that might be good advice, but it still seems to put the pressure back on the poor person who's yeah. exhausted from trying sure. to deal with this stuff. And now yeah. they've got to somehow be insightful enough, like you were insightful enough to figure it out. Yeah. I think this is where the work of the Holy Spirit is so important. Mm. You know, the Holy Spirit brings things up that we don't even know, or maybe we haven't even looked at in our life. This is why the work of the Holy Spirit is so important. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, there's this woman, uh, Leanne Payne. I don't know if you've heard of this one. Yeah. It's kind of a, an Anglican. She, she's, she's dead now, but her, her books were so, so important. Um, as, as the Protestant denominations, even her own, the Episcopalian denomination was folding because of the homosexual question. She wrote this book called the broken image because she knew that the church was sort of going in a direction that wasn't, wasn't true. And, and so she wrote this book. She was really an integrationalist. She wasn't a therapist. She was a C.S. Lewis scholar. And she had these, he, this sort of healing, these healing conferences. And I think of her as you, as you say that, Matt, because I think she had such a, uh, a keen awareness that the Holy Spirit needs to be present in these areas. And we need to invite the Holy Spirit in to help us navigate our own selves I think of people like Bob Schutz, you know, or, or, or Andrew Comiskey, these people who are so acclimatized to the work of the Holy Spirit, because it's not, it's not helpful when a therapist is sort of looking at you like, I know why you experience everything you're experiencing. So let me just sort of get my dirty hands in there and fix you. You know, that's not helpful. (laughs) It's like, get out of my soul. You don't, you don't actually really don't know what's going on. Mm. Maybe you have some awareness of it. But that's why we need the work of the Holy Spirit. We need the whole healing community. That's why it's not just living waters or just therapy or just the Eucharist. It's all of the above, <laughs> helping us to navigate these areas and then to, to just offer them as they come, you know? And I think that has been most helpful in my own life. I definitely wasn't ready at when I came, to, came from the homosexual lifestyle and prostitutes and stuff into the light. I was not ready to to receive a tome and and just integrate like pull yourself together and be ready for marriage. Mm-hmm. That wasn't a, that would be inappropriate. That would be in a way um uh not respectful to the process of this person who's experiencing a lot of a lot of things. <laughs> and this is why I think the work of the Holy Spirit is so pivotal in these areas. <laughs> To just shift focus a little bit, if we have somebody watching who's living in the living a homosexual lifestyle right now, I can imagine their critique of you and your story being, well, of course you didn't find it fulfilling. It, it's not a fulfilling thing to be going to massage parlors and prostitutes. Mm-hmm. But if you had have actually found someone that you could have shared your life with and l- fell in love with, then you would have found it fulfilling. Mm-hmm. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, I think... Um to somebody who says that I would say, well, we have maybe a different view of what homosexuality is. Then I would see homosexuality more of as a compulsivity, you know, something 
within a, a particular person that wants to maybe um, r- repair something that they don't see in themselves. I saw that in my own experience of same-sex attraction. I, I wanted men that I wanted to be like. And in a way, I, I, didn't, I didn't just admire them. I eroticized them, you know. Okay. And this isn't to absolutize right. it. You know, I'm, I yep. want to be careful yeah, yeah. here <laughs> because everyone's story is so different. But I would say that homosexuality is by nature a compulsion. It's not nature. It would never fulfill me. Maybe it satiates satiate something in me. Maybe I feel less body shame or I feel accepted. But on a deeper level, on a, a level of nature, I would say that it, it's inherently unfulfilling. It can never fulfill because we're not made for the same. We're made for the other, sexually speaking. Mm-hmm. So I think there would be uh, a difference in definition of homosexuality and also a difference in an anthropology of I'm a man, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What's my direction? I think that design unlocks the direction, you know, as a man, I'm again, made for woman, woman for man. How many young men do you encounter? I mean, we're going to have young men who watch this, who I pray to God and I bless you, brother. If you're out there, of course you are watching this and you you have same sex attraction and you haven't shared this with anybody and you're welcome here. We love you. You know, we're so, what, what would you kind of, advice be to somebody who maybe finds their place attracted maybe they're looking at porn maybe they're not maybe it's homosexual porn they, they don't know what to do with this what yeah. would your advice to them be hmm it's a good question that's why they pay me the big bucks you ask good questions you're a good inquisitor <laughs> okay uh i mean i, I have a, a few things in my mind one I, I would say come to a living waters training <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah. I think it's important to have a boundary. What if they're young though? What if they're like sixteen? And uh, that's kind of that was the who I had in mind. You know, the young yeah. man who's who's really in at a point in his life where it's easy to be influenced one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that if I was in that position, if I was a sixteen-year-old boy with same-sex attraction, and I got all, I have got like big government, big tech, big Hollywood, all of the very attractive people telling me just embrace it and become yeah. who you are. That sounds way more appealing than yeah. just don't do it or something. Or If I were that 16-year-old, I'd probably find a good priest and just say, hey, can I talk to you? Can I bring this to the light? A priest that you trust. I don't think it has to be anybody mm-hmm. or any priest, you know? But somebody that you're like, you know, this, this person knows Jesus and I admire this person's love for the Lord. It could it also be a sister or it doesn't have to be a religious. Somebody, an adult in your life that you trust, maybe a youth minister, you know, and but, but bring it to someone you yeah, trust is the bring it to someone that you trust into the light. Yeah, and say, hey, can I? You don't have to have all the right language, you know. You don't have to watch this five million times to say it perfectly. Just say it. Just say I'm struggling here. Mm. You know, I just think that would be so helpful to invite somebody into that. Would that have been helpful for you as a sixteen-year-old? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. To say, what do, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think of this? As I say this, you know, I felt like I needed to be covered there. And hopefully that's what happens when this person expresses him or herself. It's covered? Like, what does that mean? I think of the corporal work of mercy of like clothing the naked, ah. like being vulnerable, like you're showing yeah. something, yeah. you're showing like your wound. And yeah. Please reverence it. Yeah. yeah. Like, can you cover me with my baptismal garment? Like mm. remind me of who I am, you know? And that's what I mean by a trusted member, not a worldly, we have worldly members of Jesus body too, which is kind of affirm people in their, their gayness. I don't think that's helpful. That's what I mean by somebody that you trust who loves Jesus, who knows, maybe who knows how to do this. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I would say to this person who's listening, pray for that, pray for that person. You know, it'll come to your mind. The Holy Spirit's looking for ways to come into your life pray for those people and, and, and take the opportunity to be known. What groups in the church are doing good work in this regard and those who are doing not good work? Like what, let's name names, point to groups. You're like, no, they, these people, I think they're doing good. No one's perfect. I know yeah, that. Yeah. And then maybe what are some attempts by some to uh, maybe cozy up to the LGBTQ community, but you're like, this is not the way to do it. It's a great question, Matt. Um, 
Well, I would of course, I would of course say James, Father James Martin is, is his his whole outreach, his his ministry, is confusing, and I think it undermines the gospel. How do you? How is it confusing? Um, I think what he presents is a faulty anthropology, and it's what is, sorry. What does that mean? What? How is he presenting it? That's faulty. I think allowing persons who experience whatever, um, wherever they're at, at the spectrum of same sex yeah. attraction or gender dysphoria, that this is who they are. Oh, I see. Championing oh, them see. as like, this is my identity. This that is makes sense. my nature and my yeah. direction. I just think that's dangerous. And, and you think he is doing that? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I, I think he may be clever in the way he does it, mm -hmm. um, but I think he's doing that. I think it is in a way feeding the Manichaean Gnostic heresy still alive today of splitting people off body and soul mm. that I, I actually don't have to reckon with my body. I think, I think father James Martin is doing that today. Okay. And I think that's important for us to say we're in a, we're in a junk in a juncture in the church and we got to get it right. As we you have say. to get it right. We, we can't be diplomatic. A lot of Catholics are, we are so diplomatic that we fail to actually name what is wrong? <laughs> it's not helpful. So outreach, dignity, USA is like a another ministry that's okay. been around, and that that has very confusing, similar okay. to James Martin. Okay. Uh, new ways ministries is also unhelpful. Yeah, very. Okay. I would find I that haven't heard of these. And so. Very unhelpful. I mean, but they mm. would be so radical on the spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> those who I think are 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 doing a good job. I mean, I love courage. Mm -hmm. I do love courage. I, I have deep respect for courage. Father John Harvey, Father Paul Czech, Father Bochansky. These, these are men who know the church is teaching and they're, they've been custodians of that mm. for 40 years, 40 plus years. They were founded the same year as Desert Stream. And uh, I, I love them. I love what they're doing. Mm. Um, others, I'm a little hesitant here, Matt, but I will I will just say, I, 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 lo I love what, People are doing, for example, like Eden Invitation. There, mm -hmm. There's like a good ethos, but I think their resource page is really confusing. <laughs> mm. If we can get kind of nitty gritty in yeah, that way. So. Um, I think they've they've in a, um, broadcasted this this movement called Revoice. And it's more of an evangelical phenomenon than a Catholic one. But there's this side A and side B of Revoice. So Revoice is the umbrella. Side A is sort of... Uh, Christian and gay and acting out. Okay. So that's the side A. And then the side B is um, Christian, gay, but celibate, you know? And I just think again- Are, are they affirming both of these things? Uh, yes. Yeah, so they, they hold both of the, a conference with both sides, so to speak. Without calling A to repentance. Without calling those engaged in homosexual oh. lifestyle to repentance. It, it, yeah, kind exactly. Of accepting all of it. It, yeah. it would kind of hold the tension of, okay. of this is what people can choose in a mm -hmm. way. Um, I just think that's dangerous. You know, I think it's sloppy chastity that doesn't lead to integration, actually mm -hmm. doesn't lead to freedom. Um, so I, I would say proceed with caution, of course, you know, and I think I, I say these things because I, I have such a heart for the truth in these areas. Yeah. If I landed in one of these ministries that don't have it right, in my opinion, where would I be? Would I be a confused priest? <laughs> mm. Would I be a disgruntled, you know, celibate? Uh, I, I dare I say I probably wouldn't be married to Anya if I didn't have somebody giving me vision for more. Mm. So I would say, yeah, that would be my opinion on that, Matt. But yeah, that's really helpful. All right, I want to say thank you to Emmaus Academy. They've put out this brand new digital platform to help you grow in your love of sacred scripture and therefore your love of Christ. If you're like me, you know how tempting it is just to waste so much of your day on YouTube, like maybe you're doing now, or listening to political podcasts and other things. The truth is we do often have the time to grow in our knowledge and love of scripture. We just need a helping hand. And that's what this brand new digital learning platform is going to help you do. It has short courses on scripture that you can take. You can learn from Dr. Scott Hahn, uh, Dr. John Bergsma, Father Boniface Hicks, many more. I've been on this platform. I have a subscription to it. And um, I mean it when I say it's actually really excellent and it'll help you love scripture. I think a lot of us want to love scripture, but we find we 
we fight, I don't know, we, we feel guilty that we don't love it as much as we should. Platforms like this will help you do that. So click the link in the description, stpaulcenter.com slash Matt and sign up. When you sign up, you get two weeks free to the entire platform. I mean, think about how many times you and I have sub subscribed to say Hulu or something else. Um, when we could be doing something like this and growing in our love of scripture. So again, stpaulstandard.com slash Matt. Go sign up today. You get two weeks for free. If you don't think it's worth it after that time, cancel it. You won't be charged a cent, but I think you'd be really impressed yeah. with what you see. Thank you so much for, for being here again. As we wrap up, tell us more about your ministry that you're involved in and what Great. you offer. So um, for those of us who are listening um, abroad, outside of the United States, we do have Living Waters International. So my colleague, Abby Ford, oversees the international initiatives. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I can put you in touch with her for sure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, three times a year, we always we, we do a Living Waters leadership training, like I mentioned before. But those are just great opportunities for people to come and experience healing, you know, and whatever it is. Um, and so the, the first one will be in conjunction with the Theology of the Body Institute of mm -hmm. January 2024, um, the second July in Kansas City. And the third and last one will be in November in California. So go to our website, desertstream.org, and you can get all that information. And then we have this great conference coming up. It's called Incarnation and Integration, mm -hmm. Let Your Kingdom Come, October 19th through the 21st. And that's in Kansas City. So if you want maybe not the intensive of Living Waters leadership training, but uh, a few days to be in in the stream, so to speak. Of when you say leadership training, mm -hmm. does that mean for those who've kind of dealt with a lot of this stuff and now they're willing to help, or is it people who like need help and they go to that conference for that reason? So the Living Waters leadership training is for for persons who want to start this in their own parish. Okay. So for Beautiful. for those Beautiful. who want to create a healing space for people. Mm. Um. So if you have a heart for that, and I'm, I'm like, where do I look? <laughs> if you have a heart for that, <laughs> yeah. come to one of our leadership trainings and be trained to learn how to do this 20 week group, mm. it's it's great. And it'll, it'll really change the face of your parish to become not only a church that's clear on the, the ethic of, of sexuality, but to actually have a praxis. How do you walk this out? Yes, theology of the body. Yes, the gospels. Yes, Benedict the 16th. But how do I actually do this? Living Waters will do that in your parish. So come and get trained, start a group, and we mm. help you do that. Um, I, that's, what that's other my resources job. do you have? I mean, do you have people who have written books that people could reach out? Do you guys have a I podcast? Do. Yeah. So this book, Rediscovering Our Lost Fullness, A Guide to Sexual Integration. Andrew oh, Kaminsky, my boss. I, that's, yours, that? that's yours. That's yours. Oh, you're so kind. So um, it's a great, it's a, just a great read. Um, it's really? it's all about. Well, uh, look, just real quick. What's Andrew's story? Because we've mentioned him several times. Yeah. I mean, you, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to get into it because I'd love to have him on one day. Andrew but just, just a real. Brief yeah, summary. So Who is he? Andrew Kamiski comes out of homosexuality himself. Uh, he was he was grappling with all of this stuff, and and his pastors realized that he was taking major ground, and he started to date this woman, Annette, who's now his wife. Mm. And they said, "How about you start gathering with persons in our church?" Um, and they did, and that became a group called Living Waters. And then they expanded beyond just those who struggled with same-sex attraction, just really anybody who needs mm. more healing. <laughs> and they've been doing that for 43 plus years and they're, they're, they're doing great. They're doing great work. Um, it, and yeah. he converted to Catholicism okay. 11, 12 years ago. What? So through Christopher West oh. was really a, a kind of the, the pivot for him and wow. reading Theology of the Body. And this is our... Living Waters guidebook. This is Look yours too, brother. This here, I'll hold it up so, to the camera so we can see it. But it's great. It's it's you can uh, have, pull get, it back to your face where the focus is. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Right I nose. said back to your face, not, <laughs> not in front on your of, face, but, but whatever. Since you wanted to be offended about it, it's fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> that better. But get get the book. Like it's a roadmap. It's been honed for those forty years. What? It's it's a wonderful resource. There's video teachings that go with each chapter. So even if you don't, maybe you don't you can't start a group, just go through it yourself. It gives you language. It gives you a lexicon to speak of your own experience of sexual mm. brokenness and what Jesus can do for you. So, so glad y'all are doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thanks do you for have, having us. Do you have a podcast? Man. I do. Yeah. It's I was going to say, I think there's, as I've heard someone say many times, this will be on the points of the Aquinas bingo. There's more not podcasts like than people. There's more podcasts than people <laughs> yes. at this point. So surely you have one. What's it called? I do. It's called Desert <laughs> Streaming.
Ooh, so nice. and I, I do that that's with my. Actually, that's a clever. <laughs> did. I, that was good. Hey, that's hey. more clever than Council of Trent. I just want Trent to know that it's <laughs> yeah, very confusing. Way Council better. of Trent. I it's also it's spelled fun. wrong. I know it's spelled differently, but yeah. but follow us. Desert <laughs> just streaming. Quick crap on Trent for no reason at all. <laughs> yeah. Desert streaming. Yeah, desert streaming. It's great. So please tune in. I do it with Excellent. my colleague Katie Kamiski, who and we're we're really. Uh, mobilizing to grow more groups in this country. So we'll we'll put links to all that, right? The Already got it in oh, my notes. He's the best. Dude. Thank you. Let's go, bro. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, man. Awesome Thanks for having with me. You. Bless you, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. Wow.